it's a cruel and, and unusual punishment for you guys to have to listen to an economist after listening to Adam, but I'll try not to sound too much like an economist after uh, 4 o'clock. So what I want to do today is just step through the cycle of innovation that we've seen in consumer electronics to paint a picture of where we go from, from here and build off some of our history. We can step back and look at this guy, Alexander Graham Bell, who on March 7th, 18, uh, 70, uh, 1867, received a patent for the method of an apparatus to send voice and uh, sound uh, telegraphically, the telephone. Three days later, March 10th, he got his telephone to work, of course, sending the famous uh, sentence across that telephone, Watson, come here, I want to see you. Watson in the room next door on the receiving end, then, of course, heard it clearly came into the room. And today we have the telephone, thanks to that, uh, that work and that experiment. Or this guy, Thomas Edison, who a couple of years later received the first patent for the phonograph, the speaking machine. Uh, he later went on, of course, to invent the first working video camera. So we have a lot to, uh, to thank because of the work that he did there. And then this guy in 1927, at just 20 years old, applied for a patent for the first television system. Philo Farnsworth was uh, raised in a rural area of Utah. His idea of taking a video, taking an image, and dividing it up in lines and then transmitting it in lines came from his experience looking at how they plowed the fields in rows. And so he took that and ultimately turned that into the first television system that we have. So we have all of these guys who built ultimately the core of consumer electronics today, video, telephony, audio. And what they did and, and their focus was on reproducing bits, taking bits of information and reproducing them in another setting. And so the early focus was on this reproduction of bits. And as we moved past that reproduction of bits, we moved into a period where we started to try to amplify those bits. We entered terms like high fidelity. We focused on big speakers. Uh, we um, focused on the attributes and the features of the device. We used a lot of numbers to describe things and describe how good a product was. The numbers were those, the driving definition of what, how good a product was and where it fit into the landscape. You can see this old television advertisement for Andrea Televisions. The new big picture, 41% bigger than the previous one, a full 12 inches. And we still do this today. We still focus to a large extent on numbers, making things bigger than they were before saying that the 8,000 model surely must be better than the 7,000 model, because 8,000 is bigger than 7,000. Uh, driving and trying to use numbers to define things. We continue to try to qualify the, the quality of these devices by focusing on the quantity of the bits. Probably are all familiar with this uh, scene from the classic 1984 um, film, the, the Spinal Tap the mock documentary of the loudest rock band where they focus on their amp going to 11. And that was a, fo I mean, you know, it, it's a mock, it's a jest, but that was reality for a long time in the consumer electronics industry where they tried to push things to 11. Then we moved into a period where we started to waste bits. And this is something that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, certainly pronounced in computing, where early on, Computational power was a scarce resource, so we treated it as such. Over time, as we gained the abundance of that, we started to waste it. We created a user interface, a complete waste of computing power as a navigational tool. 1984, Apple launches the Macintosh, the first commercially successful uh, computer to have a user, a graphical user interface. And we began from that time to waste bits. We continue to waste bits. If you look at your mobile phones today, they've got multiple microphones on them, one to capture your voice and others to cancel out extraneous noises. You've got multiple cameras on your phone. Is one not good enough? No, you've got to have two. Today we're, making uh, we're now making phones that have three cameras on them so that you can do 3D imaging and other things like that on it. So we're, we're driving the bits on the devices because we can waste that computing power. 
From there, we start to then move to a period where we capture and multiply those bits. Nowhere is that more pronounced than in digital imaging, where the average US household today takes some 600 photos, and certainly there are households out there that take thousands of photos. Uh, Cisco estimates that IP traffic over the last five years increased 8x, and that over the next five years, it'll increase another 4x, that by 2015, every second of the day, one million minutes of uh, video will be streamed across IP traffic. Take us five years to watch the traffic, that just the video that uh, is sent every single minute. So we're literally drowning in bits at this point. We can produce more bits than we can handle, and we're, uh, we're moving into a phase now where we're gonna start to organize these bits to try to create relevance, to try, try to create meaning, to try to create value. Have you ever wondered why bananas are sold in multiple places within the grocery store? You find them in the fruit section, you also find them in the cereal section. Hot fudge sold in the bottled section, also sold in the ice cream, right next to the ice cream. I mean, clearly we like to put hot fudge and ice cream together and many people buying cereal or buying uh, bananas at the same time. How did they know that? Because we told the grocery stores that, we told the retailers this by what we were purchasing, by examining the data that we were giving them, by looking at what we were purchasing on a single receipt, they were able to determine uh, what we were buying and where they should position things within the store. So we, as users, are providing all of this information to retailers and to stores. Think of Pandora's service, a simple thumbs up, thumbs down, and fast forward gives them all the information they need to then build a more useful experience for us, taking an abundance of bits and trying to create meaning from those bits so that we have a more enjoyable experience. Netflix is using the movies that we rent and the movies that others rent to create algorithms so that we can receive stronger recommendations. When we're overwhelmed with bits, we have to start to organize them and to try to create meaning from those bits. The next phase, the next decade of consumer electronics is gonna be defined by taking those bits and driving to action, creating not just meaning from those bits, but also making decisions for us and on our behalf. We're still a pretty far away, away from that point. Last week, for example, I flew to Hong Kong. My computer knew that I was flying to Hong Kong. Other apps that I use knew that I was flying to Hong Kong, but yet, Many of the consumer electronics products I use didn't know that I was flying to Hong Kong. If I flipped on my television and I turned, for example, to the Weather Channel, it didn't know that I was flying to Hong Kong, so it gave me the regular feed that anybody else in my neighborhood was getting, that anybody else in the area was getting. It didn't recognize that I was getting ready to get on a plane and fly uh, to Hong Kong. Had it known that, it probably would have served up more relevant information, and so that's the next step of consumer electronics is getting these devices to communicate with each other and share the information that they already have. The information was known. My calendar had it, again, these other apps had it, but they weren't sharing that information. And that will be the next step in consumer electronics. Just some of those examples of where that information, where those bits start to become meaningful. You've got a small device by a company called Think Eco, a modlet that you can plug into any outlet, and then it records and captures all the energy use of whatever you plug into it, a toaster, a microwave oven, a coffee pot, capturing that data over time, every day, every week, and then allowing you to make informed decisions. So for example, you might recognize I'm only using that toaster in the mornings from seven to eight. Why don't I flip the power off for that outlet? And then you can conserve energy, you can start to manage your home, and you can make those uh, those decisions from a, program, uh, from a program standpoint as opposed to having to manually do it. Uh, uh, what looks like a regular pill top bottle from AT&T is actually a connected pill top bottle. So it records every time you open that pill top, uh, that uh, pill bottle. And most importantly, it also records when you don't open it. Because it's connected, it then sends you a text message to say, why haven't you opened your pills? It can also send your neighbor a text message. It can send families or doctors a text message. You can imagine that doctors could then download all of this information and look across time to see when you were taking your medicine and more importantly, when you weren't. 
And so these devices will start to talk to other devices and allow us to make more informed decision. Capturing data that's already there, all of this information exists, but we haven't until now started to capture it. A Wi-Fi enabled scale that captures not just your weight, but a variety of other metrics. From that scale, you can then have your weight sent to Facebook. You can tweet it because <laughs> everyone should have their weight sent via Twitter to all of their friends and followers. Um, but in reality, wouldn't it be great if it was sent to, for example, a connected refrigerator? And then it could say, Sean, stay away from that chocolate cake. <laughs> Not this week. Or if it was in that refrigerator and in that smart home, if you will, we had a, a cookbook. And then it could make recommendations of what I might eat that week to achieve other goals that I had set. And of course, watches and other devices that have historically been uh, reserved for an analog world are now moving into a digital world and they can capture a variety of these metrics. Again, these metrics already existed, we just weren't capturing them. So we've had this giant digital transition. We've moved from an analog world to a digital world. We're now going to start to turn all of these bits that already exist into digital bits and then we can analyze them, make informed decisions from them. And that drives us to the sensorization of consumer tech which is what will be the defining aspect of consumer tech over the next decade. These look like a normal pair of ski goggles. In fact, they're uh, full of sensors. They have a pressure sensor similar to what you have in, in some of your car tires. Why would you want a pressure sensor in your ski goggles? Pressure sensors tell how high you are. So together with the GPS that's also embedded in the ski goggles, you've created an altimeter. There's memory on board, so it captures every single ski run that you take. It records all of this information, how fast you were going, average speeds, every single run, vertical feet, and then you can take that information and brag to your friends how many vertical feet you logged, uh, measure calorie um, burn, or anything else that you want to do with that information. In the future, right now it's still a very manual process, in the future we'll let the devices handle that information in the background and help us make uh, more informed decisions. So in that final stage, we move into a world where all of these devices have embedded sensors and we turn atoms into bits. We're already starting to do that. Of course, today's smartphone has a plethora of sensors in them. We've talked about some of those, but think about the accelerometers, the gyroscopes, all of those capture in essence, information that was um, already existing but not yet being captured. Microsoft's Connect is the quintessential example of sensorization in today's consumer tech. The fastest launching consumer product of all times. It sold 8 million units in just 60 days. It is a box full of sensors. Four microphones, three cameras, uh, an accelerometer. It captures uh, the user uh, information and then turns that into whatever it needs to be turned into. This is a small device that helps measure your sleep pattern. So then you can then adjust how well you're sleeping. You can adjust things. We're going to start to use consumer tech to influence all aspects of our life, capturing this data and making informed decisions. So the question then that I leave you with is, where do we go with these bits of information? We get to the point where we're capturing atoms and turning them into digital bits. What devices will we share that information with? We've got portable devices that we carry with us now. We'll be able to uh, capture things like our uh, blood oxygen level, other health measures. We'll be able to um, capture information when we're in the home or when we're on the go and send that to multiple devices. So I leave that with, uh, with you. Thank you very much.